Hello, thank you for joining me today. We've been reading through A Course in Miracles, the main text, and today we'll be reading chapter 18, sections six through nine. Chapter 18 is the passing of the dream. And starting here with chapter six, or section six within this chapter, Beyond the Body. There is nothing outside of you. That is what you must ultimately learn, for it is the realization that the kingdom of heaven is restored to you. For God created only this, and he, he did not depart from it, nor leave it separate from himself. The kingdom of heaven is dwelling, is the dwelling place of the Son of God, who left not his Father, and dwells not apart from him. Heaven is not a place, nor a condition. It is merely an awareness of perfect oneness and the knowledge that there is nothing else, nothing outside this oneness and nothing else within. What could God give but knowledge of himself? What else is there to give? The belief that you could give and get something else, something outside of yourself, has cost you the awareness of heaven and of your identity. And you have done a stranger thing than you yet realize. You have displaced your guilt through your body from your mind. Yet a body cannot be guilty, for it can do nothing of itself. You who think you hate your body, deceive yourself. You hate your mind, for guilt has entered into it, and it would remain separate from your brothers, which it cannot do. Minds are joined, bodies are not. Only by assigning to the mind the properties of the body does separation seem possible. And it is mind that seems to be fragmented and private and alone. It is guilt which keeps it separate, is projected to the body which suffers and dies because it is attacked to hold the separation in the mind and let it not know its identity. Mind cannot attack, but it can make fantasies and direct the body to act them out. Yet it is never what the body does that seems to satisfy, unless the mind believes the body is actually acting out its fantasies, it will attack the body by increasing the projection of its guilt upon it. In this, the mind is clearly delusional. It cannot attack, but it maintains that it can and uses what it does to hurt the body to prove it can. The mind cannot attack, but it can deceive itself. And this is all it does when it believes it has attacked the body. It can project its guilt, but it will not lose it through projection. And though it clearly can misperceive the function of the body, it cannot change its function from what the Holy Spirit establishes it to be. The body was not made by love. Yet love does not condemn it and use it lovingly, respecting that the Son of God has made and using it to save him from illusions. Would you not have the instruments of separation reinterpreted as means for salvation and used for purposes of love? Would you not welcome and support the shift from fantasies of vengeance to release from them? Your perception of the body can clearly be sick, but project not this upon the body, for you wish to make destructive what cannot destroy can have no real effect at all. What God created is only what he would have it be, being his will. You cannot make his will destructive. You can make fantasies in which your will conflicts with his, but that is all. It is insane to use the body as the scapegoat for guilt, directing its attack and blaming it for what you wished it to do. 
it is impossible to act out our fantasies, for it is still the fantasies you want, and they have nothing to do with what the body does. It does not dream of them, and they but make it a liability where it could be an asset. For fantasies have made your body your enemy, weak, vulnerable, and treacherous, worthy of the hate that you invested in. How has this served you? You have identified with this thing you hate, the instrument of vengeance and the perceived source of your guilt. You have done this to a thing that has no meaning, proclaiming it to be the dwelling place of God's son and turning it against him. This is the host of God that you made, and neither God nor his most holy son can enter an abode that harbors hate, and where you have sown the seeds of vengeance, violence, and death. This thing you have made to serve your guilt stands between you and other minds. The minds are joined, but you do not identify with them. You see yourself locked in a separate prison, removed and unreachable, incapable of reaching out as being reached. You hate this prison you have made and would destroy it, but you would not escape from it, leaving it harmed without your guilt upon it. Yet only thus can you escape. The home of vengeance is not yours. The place you set aside to house your hate is not a prison, but an illusion of yourself. The body is a limited, is a limit imposed on the universal communication that is an eternal property of the mind. But the communication is internal. Mind reaches to itself. It does not go out. Within itself, it has no limits, and there is nothing outside it. It encompasses you entirely, you within it, and it within you. There is nothing else, anywhere or ever. The body is outside you, and but seems to surround you, shutting you off from others and keeping you apart from them. It is not there. There is no barrier between God and his son, nor can his son be separated from himself, except in illusions. This is not his reality, though he believes it is. Yet this can only be if God were wrong. God would have, have had to create differently and to have separated himself from his son to make this possible. He would have had to create different things and to establish different orders of reality, only some of which were love. Yet love must be forever like itself, changeless forever and forever without alternative. And so it is. You cannot put a barrier around yourself because God placed none between himself and you. You can stretch out your hand and reach to heaven. You whose hands are joined have begun to reach beyond the body, but not outside yourself, to reach your shared identity together. Could this be outside you, where God is not? Is he a body, and did he create you as he is not, and where he cannot be? You are surrounded only by him. What limits can there be on you whom he encompasses? Everyone has experienced what he would call a sense of being transported beyond himself. This feeling of liberation far exceeds the dream of freedom, sometimes hoped for in special relationships. It is a sense of actual escape from limitations. If you will consider what this transportation really entails, you will realize that it is a sudden awareness, unawareness of the body and a joining of yourself and something else in which your mind enlarges to encompass it. It becomes part of you as you unite with it and both become as whole as neither is perceived as separate. 
What really happens is that you have given up the illusion of a limited awareness and lost your fear of union. The love that instantly replaces it extends to what has freed you and unites with it. And while this lasts, you are not uncertain of your identity and would not limit it. You have escaped from fear to peace, asking no questions of reality, but merely accepting it. You have accepted this instead of the body and have let yourself be one with something beyond it simply by not letting your mind be limited to it, or limited by it, rather. This can occur regardless of the physical distance that seems to be between you and what you join, of your respective positions in space and of your differences in size and seeming quality. Time is not relevant. It can occur with something past, present, or anticipated, the something can be anything and anywhere, a sound, a sight, a thought, a memory, and even a general idea without specific reference. Yet in every case, you join it without reservation because you love it and would be with it. And so you rush to meet it, letting your limits melt away, suspending all the laws your body obeys, and gently setting them aside. There is no violence at all in this escape. The body is not attacked, but simply properly perceived. It does not limit you merely because you would have it not have it so. You are not really lifted out of it. It cannot contain you. You go where you would be, gaining, not losing, a sense of self. In these instances of release from physical restrictions, you experience much of what happens in the holy instant. The lifting of the barriers of time and space, the sudden experience of peace and joy, and above all, the lack of awareness of the body and of the questioning whether or not all this is possible. It is possible because you want it. The sudden expansion of awareness that takes place with your desire for it is the irresistible appeal the holy instant holds. It calls to you to be yourself within its safe embrace. There are the laws of limit lifted for you to welcome you to openness and of mind and freedom. Come to this place of refuge where you can be yourself in peace, not through destruction, not through a breaking out, but merely by a quiet melting in. For peace will join you there, simply because you have been willing to let go the limits you have placed upon love, and joined it where it is, and where it led you, in answer to its gentle call to be at peace. Chapter 18, The Passing of the Dream, Section 7, I Need Do Nothing. I just realized my headphones were not plugged in, so I don't know if this will be better, better audio or not, but I plugged my headphones in. So this is section seven, I need do nothing. You still have too much faith in the body as a source of strength. What plans do you make that do not involve its comfort or protection or enjoyment in some way? This makes the body an end and not a means in your interpretation. And this always means you will find sin attractive. No one accepts atonement for himself who still accepts sin as his goal. You have thus not meant your one responsibility. Atonement is not welcome by those who prefer pain and destruction. There is one thing that you have never done. You have not utterly forgotten the body. It has perhaps faded in times from your sight, but it has not yet completely disappeared. You are not asked to let this happen for more than an instant, yet it is in this instant that the miracle of atonement happens. 
Afterwards, you will see the body again, but never quite the same. And every instant that you spend without awareness of it gives you a different view of it when you return. At no single instant does the body exist at all. It is always remembered or anticipated, but never experienced just now. Only its past and future make it seem real. Time controls it entirely, for sin is never wholly in the present. In any single instant, the attraction of guilt would be experienced as pain and nothing else, and would be avoided. It has no attraction now. Its whole attraction is imagery, and therefore must be thought of in the past or in the future. It is impossible to accept the holy instant without reservation, unless, just for an instant, you are willing to see no past or future. You cannot prepare for it without placing it in the future. Release is given you the instant you desire. Many have spent a lifetime in preparation and have indeed achieved their instance of success. This course does not attempt to teach more than they learned in time, but it does aim at saving time. You may be attempting to follow a very long road to the goal you have accepted. It is extremely difficult to reach atonement by fighting against sin. Nor is a lifetime of contemplation and long periods of meditation aimed at detachment from the body necessary. All such attempts will ultimately succeed because of their purpose. Yet the means are tedious and very time consuming. For all of them look to the future for release from a state of present unworthiness and inadequacy. Your way will be different, not in purpose, but in means. A holy relationship is a means of saving time. One instant together, one instant spent together restores the universe to both of you. You are prepared. Now you need but to remember, you need to do nothing. It would be far more profitable now merely to concentrate on this than consider what you should do. When peace comes at last to those who wrestle with the temptation and fight against the giving in to sin, when the light comes at last into the mind given to contemplation. Oh, I just did that again. Let me start the whole sentence over. When peace comes at last to those who wrestle with temptation and fight against the giving in to sin, when light comes at last into the mind given to contemplation, or when the goal is finally achieved by anyone, it always comes with just one happy realization. I need do nothing. Here is the ultimate release, which everyone will one day find in his own way, at his own time. You do not need this time. Time has been saved for you because you and your brother are together. This is the special means this course is using to save you time. You are not making use of the course if you insist on using means which have served others well, neglecting what was made for you. Save time for me by only this one preparation and practice doing nothing else. I need do nothing is a statement of allegiance, a truly undivided loyalty. Believe it for just one instant and you will accomplish more than is given to a century of contemplation or of struggle against contemplation. Rather temptation, struggle against temptation. To do anything involves the body. And if you recognize you need do nothing, you have written the body's value from the, you've withdrawn the body's value from your mind. Here is the quick and open door through which you slip past centuries of effort and escape from time. This is the way in which sin loses all attraction right now. For here is time denied 
and past and future gone. Who needs do nothing has no need for time. To do nothing is to rest and make a place within you where the activity of the body ceases to demand attention. Into this place the Holy Spirit comes and there abides. He will remain when you forget and the body's activities return to occupy your conscious mind. Yet there will always be this place of rest to which you can return. And you will be more aware of this quiet center of the storm than all its raging activities. This quiet center in which you do nothing will remain with you, giving you rest in the midst of every doing on which you are being sent. For from this center will you be directed how to use the body sinlessly. It is this center from which the body is absent that will keep it so in your awareness of it. Chapter 18, The Passing of the Dream, Section 8, The Little Garden. It is only the awareness of the body that makes love seem limited. For the body is a limit on love. The belief in limited love was its origin, and it was made to limit the unlimited. Think not that this is merely allegorical, for it was made to limit you. Can you see yourself within a body now? No. Let me do that again. Can you see your... Can you... Oh, <laughs> Can you see? No, still don't have it. Hang on. Can you who see yourself within a body know yourself as an idea? I'm going to read it again. Can you who see yourself within a body know yourself as an idea? Everything you recognize, you identify with externals something outside of yourself. You cannot even think of God without a body or in some form you think you recognize. The body cannot know. And while you limit your awareness to its tiny senses, you will not see the grandeur that surrounds you. God cannot come into a body, nor can you join him there. Limits on love will always seem to shut him out and keep him apart, keep you apart from him. The body is a tiny fence around a little part of a glorious and complete idea. It draws a circle, infinitely small, around a very little segment of heaven splintered from the whole, proclaiming that within it is your kingdom where God cannot enter. Within this kingdom, the ego rules and cruelty. And to defend this little speck of dust, it binds you, it bids you fight against the universe. This fragment of your mind is such a tiny part of it that could you but appreciate the whole, you would see instantly that it is like the smallest sunbeam to the sun or like the faintest ripple on the surface of the ocean. It's in its amazing arrogance, this tiny sunbeam has decided it is the sun. This almost imperceptible ripper, ripple hails itself as the ocean. Think how alone and frightened is this little thought this infinitesimal illusion, holding itself apart against the universe. The sun becomes the sunbeam's enemy that would devour it. And the ocean terrifies the little ripple and wants to swallow it. Yet neither the sun nor the ocean is even aware of all this strange and meaningless activity. They merely continue, unaware that they are feared and hated by a tiny segment of themselves. 
even that segment is not lost to them, for it could not survive apart from them. And what it thinks is, is, is in no way changes its total dependence on them for its being. Its whole existence still remains in them. Without the sun, the sunbeam would be gone. The ripple without the ocean is inconceivable. Such is the strange position in which those in a world inhabited by bodies seem to be. Each body seems to house a separate mind, a disconnected thought, living alone and in no way joined by the thought, to the thought by which it was created. Each tiny frag fragment seems to be self-contained, needing another for some things, but by no means totally dependent on its create one creator for everything, needing the whole to give it any meaning, for by itself it does not mean it does not mean, does mean nothing, for by itself it does mean nothing, nor has it any life apart or by itself. Like to the sun and ocean, your self continues, unmindful that this tiny part regards itself as you. It is not missing. It could not exist if it were separate nor would the whole be whole without it. It is not a separate kingdom ruled by an idea of separation from the rest, nor does a fence around it preventing it from joining the rest and keeping it apart from its creator. This little aspect is no different from the whole, being continuous with it and one with it. It leads no separate life, because its life is the oneness in which its being was created. Do not accept this little fenced off aspect as yourself. The sun and ocean are as nothing beside what you are. The sunbeam sparkles only in the sunlight and the ripple dances as it rests upon the ocean. Yet in neither the sun nor the ocean is the power that rests in you. Would you remain within your tiny kingdom, a sorry king, a bitter ruler of all that he surveys, who looks on nothing, yet would still die to defend it? This little self is not your kingdom. Arched high above it and surrounding it with love is the glorious whole, which offers all its happiness and deep content. To every part. The little aspect that you think you set apart is no exception. Love knows no bodies and reaches to everything it created like itself. Its total lack of limit is its meaning. It is completely impartial in its giving, encompassing only to preserve and keep complete what it would give. In your tiny kingdom, you have so little. Should it not then be there that you would call love to enter? Look at the desert, dry and unproductive, scorched and joyless. What makes up your little king? That makes up your little kingdom. And realize that life and joy that love would bring to it from where it comes and where it would return to you. The thought of God surrounds your little kingdom, waiting at the barrier you built to come inside and shine upon the barren ground. See how life springs up everywhere. The desert becomes a garden, green and deep and quiet, offering rest to those who have lost their way and wander in the dust. Give them a place of refuge, prepared by love for them, once, a de once where the desert was. And everyone you welcome will bring love with him from heaven for you. They enter one by one into this holy place, but they will not depart as they had come alone. The love they brought with them will stay with them as it will stay with you. And under its beneficence, your little garden will expand and reach out to everyone who thirsts for living water, but has grown too weary to go on alone. Go out and find them, for they bring yourself with them. 
and lead them gently to your quiet garden and receive their blessing there. So will it grow and stretch across the desert, leaving no lonely little kingdoms locked away from love and leaving you inside. And you will recognize yourself and see your little garden gently transformed into the kingdom of heaven with all the love of its creator shining upon it. The holy instant is your invitation to love, to enter into your bleak and joyless kingdom and to transform it into a garden of peace and welcome. Love's answer is inevitable. It will come because you came without the body and interposed no barriers to interfere with its glad coming. In the holy instant, you ask of love only what it offers everyone, neither less nor more. Asking for everything, you will receive it, and your shining self will lift the tiny aspect that you tried to hide from heaven straight to heaven. No part of love calls on whole in vain. No son of God remains outside his fatherhood. Be sure of this. Love has entered your special relationship and entered fully at your weak request. You do not recognize that love has come because you have not let go of all the barriers you hold against your brother. And you will not be able to give love welcomely separate or give love welcome separately. You could know more know God alone than he knows you without your brother. But together, you could no more be unaware of love than love could know you not or fail to recognize itself in you. You have reached the end of an ancient journey, not realizing yet that it is over. You are still worn and tired, and the desert's dust still seems to cloud your eyes and keep you sightless. Yet he whom you welcomed has come to you and would welcome you. He has waited long to give you this. Receive it now of him, for he would have you know him. Only a little wall of dust still stands between you. Blow on it lightly and with happy laughter and it will fall away. Walk into the garden of love has and walk into the garden love has prepared for both of you. Chapter 18, The Passing of the Dream, Section 9, The Two Worlds. You have been told to bring the darkness to the light and guilt to holiness. And you have been also told that error must be corrected at its source. Therefore, it is the tiny part of yourself, the little thought that seems split off and separate, the Holy Spirit needs. The rest is fully in God's keeping and needs no guide. Yet this wild and delusional thought needs help because in its delusions, it thinks it is the Son of God, whole and omnipotent, sole ruler of the kingdom it's set apart to tyrannize by madness into obedience and slavery. This is the little part you think you stole from heaven. Give it back to heaven. Heaven is not lost, but you have lost sight of heaven. Let the Holy Spirit remove it from the withered kingdom in which you set it off, surrounded by darkness, guided, guarded by attack, and reinforced by hate. Within its barricades is still a tiny segment of the Son of God, complete and holy, serene and unaware of what you think surrounds it. Be you not separate, for the one who does surround it has brought union to you, returning to your little offering of darkness to the eternal light. How is this done? Is it, it is extremely simple being based on what this little kingdom really is. The barren sands, the darkness, and the lifelessness are seen only through the body's eyes. 
its bleak sight is distorted and its messages it, and the messages it transmits to you who made it to limit your awareness are little and limited and so fragmented they are meaningless from the world of bodies made by insanity insane messages seem to be returned to the mind that made it and these messages bear witness to this world pronouncing it as true for you set forth these messengers to bring this back to you everything these messages relay to you is quite external there are no messages that speak of what lies underneath for it is not the body that could speak of this its eyes perceive it not its senses remain quite unaware of it its tongue cannot relay its messages yet god can bring you there if you are willing to follow the holy spirit through seeming terror trusting him not to abandon you and leave you there for it is not his purpose to frighten you but only yours you are severely tempted to abandon him at the outside ring of fear but he would lead you safely through and far beyond the circle of fear lies just below the level the body sees and seems to be the whole foundation on which the world is based here are all the illusions all the twisted thoughts all the insane attacks the fury the vengeance and betrayal that were made to keep the guilt in place so that the world could rise from it and keep it hidden its shadow rises to the surface enough to hold its most external manifestations in darkness and to bring despair and loneliness to it and keep it joyless yet its intensity is veiled by its heavy coverings and kept apart from what was made to keep it hidden the body cannot see this for the body arose from this for its protection which depends on keeping it not seen. The body's eyes will never look at it, yet they will see what it dictates. The body will remain guilt's messenger and will act as it directs as long as you believe that guilt is real. For the reality of guilt is the illusion that seems to make it heavy and opaque impenetrable and a real foundation for the ego's thought system its thinness and transparency are not apparent until you see the light behind it and then you see it as fragile veil before the light this heavy seeming barrier this artificial floor that looks like rock is like a bank of low dark clouds that seem to be a solid wall before the sun its impenetrable appearance is wholly an illusion it gives way softly to the mountaintops that rise above it and has no power to hold at all to hold back anyone willing to climb above it and see the sun it is not strong enough to stop a button's fall nor hold a feather try but to touch it and it disappears attempt to grasp it and your hands hold nothing yet in this cloud bank it is easy to see a whole world rising a solid mountain range a lake a city all rise in your imagination and from the clouds the messengers of your perception return to you assuring you that it is there figures stand out and move about actions seem real and forms appear and shift from loveliness to the grotesque and back and forth they go as long as you would play the game of children's make-believe yet however long you play it and regardless of how much imagination you bring to it you do not confuse it with the world below nor seek to make it real so it should be with the dark clouds of guilt no more impenetrable and no more substantial you will not bruise yourself against them in traveling through let your guide teach you their unsubstantial nature as he leads you past them for beneath them is a world of light whereon they cast no shadows 
their shadows lie upon the world beyond them, still farther from the light. Yet from them to the light, their shadows cannot fall. This world of light, this circle of brightness, is the real world where guilt meets with forgiveness. Here, the world outside is seen anew, without the shadow of guilt upon it. Here is the new perception, where everything is bright and shining with innocence. Washed in the waters of forgiveness and cleansed of every evil thought you laid upon it. Here there is no tack upon the Son of God, and you are welcome. Here is your innocence waiting to clothe you and protect you and make you ready for the final step in the journey inward. Here are the dark and heavy garments of guilt laid by and gently replaced by purity and love. Yet even forgiveness is not the end. Forgiveness does not make lovely, but it does not create. It is the source of healing, but it is the messenger of love and not its source. Here you are led that God himself can take the final step unhindered, for here does nothing interfere with love, letting it be itself. A step beyond this holy place, a step further inward, but the one you cannot take, transports you to something completely different. Here is the source of light, nothing perceived, nothing forgiven or transformed but merely known. This course will lead to knowledge, but knowledge itself is still beyond the scope of our curriculum. Nor is there any need for us to try to speak of what must forever lie beyond words. We need remember only that whoever attains the real world beyond which learning cannot go, will go beyond it, but in a different way. Where learning ends, there God begins. For learning ends before him who is complete, where he begins, and where there is no end. It is not for us to dwell on what cannot be attained. There is too much to learn. The readiness for knowledge still must be attained. Love is not learned. Its meaning lies within itself. And learning ends when you have recognized all it is not. That is the interference. That is what needs to be undone. Love is not learned because there never was a time in which you knew it not. Learning is useless in the presence of your creator whose acknowledgement of you and yours of him so far transcend all learning that everything you learned is meaningless replaced by ever, forever by the knowledge of love and its one meaning. Your relationship with your brother has been uprooted from the world of shadows, and its unholy purpose has been safely brought through the barriers of guilt, washed with forgiveness, and set shining, and firmly rooted in the world of light. From there it calls to you to follow the course it took, lifted high above the darkness and gently placed before the heavens, the gates of heaven. The holy instant in which you were united is but the messenger of love, sent from beyond forgiveness to remind you of all that lies beyond it. Yet it is through forgiveness that it will be remembered. And when the memory of God has come to you in the holy place of forgiveness, you will remember nothing else, and memory will be as useless as learning, for your only purpose will be creating. Yet this is not, yet, I'm sorry, yet this you cannot know until every perception has been cleansed and purified and finally removed forever. Forgiveness removes only the nature, lifting the shadows from the world and carrying it safe and sure within its gentleness to the bright world of new and clean perception. There is your purpose now, and it is there that peace awaits you. So that is the end 
of chapter 18. Thank you for joining me. We're going to start uh, the next chapter will be chapter 19. We'll start that next Sunday. I do apologize for the delay in the posting of this. I had intended to have it posted for you last Sunday. And when I was prepping it, I discovered that I had completely lost the uh, last section, chapter or section nine was completely missing. So I must have muted the mic to cough or something and then uh, neglected to unmute it. So um, I apologize. I am trying to do these every Sunday. Uh, it is difficult, especially now that summer is hit and we are so much busier uh, with my other business, my lodging business. So again, thank you so much. You can message me through either uh, YouTube or SoundCloud or Facebook, or you can visit my websites, lindalamp.com and lindalamp.shop. Thank you again. We'll see you next week. Namaste and much love.